who saw these images 20 years ago will forget them. The crowds in Berlin tearing down the past. The wall that divided East and West, them from us, was coming down. In the euphoria of the moment, many wondered, why not get rid of all walls? In this era of globalization, who needs them? If information, capital and goods can move freely between countries, why not people? And just for a moment, that may have seemed possible. But then everything changed. With the events of 9-11, fear gripped the West. The focus shifted to security and the dangers lurking outside our borders. Walls were back and with a vengeance. A promise they would protect us from terrorists, criminals, and the surging tide from the third world looking for a better life. And it ignited a debate. There is a tremendous clash of interest between the economic and the security establishments. Economic interests such as NAFTA would like to see the walls disappear. They want easier flow of goods, of migrants, of capital. The security establishment want to build the walls up again. And these are two very powerful lobbies who in a sense are clashing with each other today over the meaning of borders in a post 9-11 world. Since the Berlin Wall came down, more than a dozen new walls have gone up. The United States, so forcefully opposed to the Berlin Wall, is now literally moving mountains to build a wall of its own. The European Union opened its internal borders, but created a fortress around itself. And rising in the Middle East, a wall between Israel and the occupied territories. Can a wall, a technology as old as civilization, solve the problems of the 21st century? Stretching for over 3,000 kilometers from California to Texas, the border between the United States and Mexico is the most frequently crossed in the world, shared by trading partners, communities, and families. For generations, Mexican workers have crossed into the U.S. to work in the fields, factories, and service industry. When the work runs out, most go home. But not all. The vast majority of the 12 million illegal immigrants in the United States today are Mexican. Border towns like Nogales, Arizona, were feeling overwhelmed. Illegal immigration and folks coming over here would bleed into the stores, which then made law enforcement agents run into the store. So all of a sudden you're conducting business and you've got in your dressing rooms, you, ha you have people hiding from the Border Patrol and you have the Border Patrol walking through your stores. And it was really not a good, it, it, it was an impediment to business at, at, at that time. Border towns were also experiencing a brisk traffic in illegal goods. Drugs going north, guns going south. Couple this with the fears of another 9-11, and Americans wanted action. You have to build a border fence, and you've got to have a real border, not just for immigration issues, but also because of security issues. And right now, I, I wrote the law that extends that border fence 854 miles across Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and California. We need to border, build the border fence. It's the law, and when people come to this country, they got to knock on the front door because the back door is going to be closed. In 2006, President Bush signed the Secure Fence Act, setting in motion one of the most ambitious public works projects in living memory. 700 miles of concrete and steel straddling a continent from California to Texas at a cost of $4 million a mile and millions more to maintain. Some believe that even at this price, it may not make Americans as secure as they think. The migrants that are aimed at by these walls are not a security threat at all. They just want to work. 
And it's quite ironic to see that the drug dealers are, in fact, moving freely through the border, buying, gun, buying guns, uh, delivering dope, etc. They, they do that freely. It's only penalizing the small migrant who needs the work and whose work the American economy needs. This is Friendship Park, with its sweeping view of the Pacific. People call it the birthplace of the border. For generations, families and friends from San Diego and Tijuana have been meeting here. John Fanestel, a Methodist minister and director of Foundation for Change, has been serving communion to people on both sides of the fence. It's his way of affirming the bonds between the two communities. We know that you are bigger than any barrier that our government may put before us. Amen. Pues gracias por participar. Old timers I've talked to remember taking their bikes and hopping over the chain and riding their bike around Tijuana for the day and coming back to San Diego. In fact, in 1971, the park was rededicated by Pat Nixon to honor the friendship between Mexico and the United States. First you could say it was just a boundary, um, then it, there was a fence and now a wall is being built across it. Uh, in recent months, the Department of Homeland Security has announced their intent to close public access to this place. So U.S. citizens, uh, people who use the park, as well as families who want to visit with friends uh, will no longer be able to do so at this location. And the wall is coming nearer by the day, pushing its way through the mesas to the Pacific Coast and Friendship Park. This canyon, known as Smuggler's Gulch, is an infamous corridor for traffickers in guns, drugs, and people. The wall will stop criminal activity here, forcing it to move elsewhere. However, this canyon, and the once protected Tijuana estuary it's part of, will be destroyed. I think it is a way for them to demonstrate to the American public that action is being taken. Nobody can argue that, you know, the government is not doing something. They are clearly doing a lot. The efficacy of it is a whole nother matter. Problems like migration and income inequality between the two countries, and ecological challenges of development and a first world and third world country sitting side by side against each other. These are complex problems to which there are no simple solutions. The border was first sealed in the urban areas, El Paso, San Diego, Nogales, and Douglas. Then through parts of New Mexico and Arizona, skipping the Arizona desert. They thought the desert would act as a wall, but they were wrong. The road to the American dream cuts through Altar, Mexico. At 70 miles south of the U.S.-Mexico border, this is now the most popular staging ground for illegal migrants trying to enter the United States. In the town square, the migrants wait. If you've got the money, there are people here who say they'll get you across the desert and into the promised land. Father Prisciliano has seen the change in Altar's economy. People used to make money farming. Now, he says, they make it from the brutal service industry known as human trafficking. Traffickers control the hostels in town where people stay before they begin their trek across the desert. Each room in the hostel is controlled by one trafficker. Ordinarily, it's one for the camera. One, two, three. But when it's the family, practically, 
de aquí, que es una parte de aquí hasta allá, que es la tabla, entran cinco personas si es por familia. Así es lo ordinario. Si no traes más que 40 pesos, 50 pesos, vas a quedar así. Pero si traes 50 pesos, 80 pesos, ya te van a vender la cobija. Si traes 20 pesos más, 10 pesos más, te van a vender la otra cobija para que te tapes. Entonces, este es un dormitorio comunitario donde mínimo van a dormir 80 gentes aquí. La casa de huéspedes de las que hay aquí en Altar es muy parecido a los barcos donde se transportaban a los esclavos. Hoy la migración, así actual como la tenemos, es una forma de esclavitud moderna. A two-hour ride brings migrants from Altar to the dusty border town of Sasebe. From here, it's a 75-mile trek to the closest American town. Since the wall was built, migrants are forced to take more dangerous routes to avoid the border patrol. The land is high desert, with extreme temperatures in the summer months. With any luck, a migrant will get a helping hand along the way. Maybe from a group like this one, called No More Deaths. Volunteers call out their offer of help. Sometimes there's an answer. Sometimes it's too late. We're standing in front of a memorial for Oseline um, Quinteros, who is a 14-year-old migrant who died while crossing. She was taking her 10-year-old um, brother to their family in the United States. We were hiking through here and happened upon her body. Um, there are people that nobody ever finds out here. At strategic places along the way, volunteers put out water, food, clothing. This container is empty. The supplies may have saved someone's life. Before 1994, there were no migrant deaths in the Arizona desert. None. Since the wall went up, 4,000 bodies have been found in this unforgiving place. Something needed to be done. It was, it was not right that the United States government should have a policy that is designed to kill people, which is exactly what, what we had. Uh, by making them uh, walk across more difficult areas and walk uh, farther. There are a fair number of people that would like to stop us from doing this. And initially they started, started with the um, argument that we were breaking the law. We've uh, adopted the motto that um, uh, humanitarian aid is not a crime. The fence itself has become a flashpoint for two very different visions of America. On this day, John Fanestel led a protest against the extension of the fence to Friendship Park. Others don't share his view. They see migrants as a threat to jobs and the American way of life. The centerpiece of the protest was the Foray Requiem, sung by the communities on both sides of the wall. The border patrol was there to draw a new line in the sand. There is something very beautiful about our country, the country of the United States. This love of country is something beautiful. But we should also be aware that close to our love of country is a great temptation. The temptation to turn our love of country into a hatred of the other. These people are criminals and they broke the law. They risked the chance 
to the country, the land of the free. To pretend that our fate is not somehow tied to the fate of our brothers and sisters from other lands. We're not ashamed to say we love our country. We love America. But if you'd like to join me at this time, you're welcome to come and join me as we proceed to the fence. No, move back. I'm going to step back because as soon as you touch me, you're under arrest. I understand the law. I understand there's a higher calling than the law. I've made a commitment to serve communion. There are people waiting for me. You really don't want to do this. All I'm doing is trying to serve communion, sir. Step back, please. No, thank you. I'm trying to serve communion. Step back, please. I need to serve communion, Then turn around and put your hands behind your back. Although access to Friendship Park has been cut off, the struggle to save it continues. This is a scar across the face of border communities. And this is a line that is being drawn across family trees. <laughs> this is a project that speaks of a, a very dark and sinister vision of what the border is and what the border should be or could be. And those of us who know the border and love the border know that the border can be something altogether different than this, that we are much better than this. We are much. We're much better than this. The European Union was created to eliminate borders between its nation states. The freedom of capital to move and people to go where the jobs are transformed it into an economic dynamo. Perhaps inevitably, it's also become a magnet for all the third world's dispossessed drawn to its prosperity. As the effects of this influx become visible on every street corner, Europe is feeling under siege. The explosive issue of immigration has dominated elections throughout the EU. Si on ne réfléchit pas à ce qu'est la France, si on ne réfléchit pas à l'identité nationale française, et si on n'explique pas cette identité à ceux qui vont devenir françaises, il ne faut pas s'étonner que l'intégration, ça ne marche pas. Bear in mind that countries like Spain, uh, Italy, uh, Ireland even, uh, who, which have been for décennies major Emigration country did become immigration countries these last years. For them, it's a completely new policy development. It's a completely new feature. And of course, it does not come as a surprise that both their public opinion and their political leadership have to cope with these new developments. Europe is becoming a fortress, but the gates may be closing too late. The third world is here, living furtively trying to survive. And Europeans are facing some tough decisions. If people trying to enter EU member states territory without being entitled or authorized to do so, if they try to, to do that, they have to be told in a way, sorry, but you can't enter. I mean, we have not delivered a visa, we have not delivered a work permit, we have not delivered a residence permit. You are not allowed to enter into our territory, and if you enter into our territory, you are going to end up in an irregular situation. So it has to be controlled. It has to be stopped. An open border policy is not on the horizon, it's not on the agenda, and cannot be on the agenda. In 1999, the European Union quietly helped finance the building of two security walls around the Spanish enclaves of Ceuta and Melilla. These two Spanish cities on the north coast of Morocco are where the northern and southern worlds meet. They have long been the gateway for migrants from Africa into Europe. These two enclaves became the holes in the dike that Europe wanted plugged. The walls were built to a height of six meters, topped with razor wire. Spain made an agreement with Morocco, a country with a dubious human rights record, to guard the walls. There is this Euro-Mediterranean dialogue, which means that countries like Libya, Morocco, Tunisia, 
have a huge role to play and must prevent immigration, illegal immigration through their territory as transit country if they want to receive development aid from the EU. And the EU is simply pursuing this policy. It's called now the neighborhood policy so that the dirty work be done by these transit countries. From the European perspective, the walls were far away, out of sight, not an issue. But all that changed one day in October 2005, when Europe was shaken by the morning news. A group of Africans, desperate to get into Europe, rushed the fence in Melilla, and the Moroccan army opened fire. Twelve people were killed and hundreds injured. For days, the town of Melilla was overrun by wounded migrants seeking help and shelter. José Palasson, the head of the human rights organization Prodin, remembers this well. Porque la gente venció el miedo y ante la situación, la gravedad de la situación que había, la gente eh, pensó eh, inmigrantes no queremos. La, la valla, la gente piensa la valla tiene que estar, pero esto no puede ser. The response of the authorities was to fortify the barrier with a third fence. Es una trampa para cazar personas. Si ese, ese muro se hiciera en cualquier lado de la Unión Europea para cazar animales, si hiciera una trampa similar, eh, estaría prohibida y automáticamente la derribarían. The crackdown had begun. The border was sealed. Migrants like these, among whom are mathematicians and engineers, were stranded in Morocco, never any closer to their dream. So I've been in this country for over five to six years now. Yeah, I've been in this situation, same condition. Unable to move forward and without the means to go home, they hide in the forest. How can you get a job? There's no way. That is why we live in the forest like animals, and we are not animals, you can see. The dog barking may mean soldiers. The Moroccan army has been accused of rounding up migrants and abandoning them in the desert to die. On the European side, the tightening of security has had other unintended consequences. Y es que cuando la gente logra pasar, ya sean marroquíes, o sea, de cualquier lugar de África, cuando la gente logra pasar, ya no quiere salir, porque si salen no pueden volver a entrar. Es decir, que antes un, cualquier persona extranjera entraba y si no encontraba trabajo, salía. Among the migrants trapped in Melilla is a group of Bangladeshis. Brought here by human traffickers, they were told they were in Europe. The problem is that they are technically on Spanish soil, but not on the mainland, and the Spanish government will not give them travel documents or permission to work. Every Saturday evening they protest in the city square. They chant, papers for everyone, we want to stay in Spain. Yo tengo 22 años, ya y hasta. ¿Falta cuánto? Yo me he perdido 5 años por Europa. Aquí en Melilla, 3 años, 3 meses. Por viajar, 2 años. 5 años perdido mi vida. ¿Cuánto falta? European countries bordering the Mediterranean believed that the sea would serve as a wall against migrants, but they were mistaken. With the route to Spain via Sauta and Melilla blocked, Many migrants travel to Libya and attempt the dangerous journey to Italy by boat. They hope to land on the tiny island of Lampedusa, a speck in the Mediterranean, and a popular holiday spot for Italian tourists. Day and night patrol boats are deployed from the island to intercept vessels that keep coming from Libya onto dinghies, crude rafts, and leaky boats furnished by their human traffickers, the migrants are pointed in the general direction of Lampedusa. 
Against all odds, some actually make it. Tourists on the island are unaware of the drama that's being played out before their eyes. By the time the patrol boats find them, they've been on the water for three to five days and are in rough shape. Most of the migrants have come looking for work. Others are asylum seekers hoping to make a refugee claim. A few are minors who, by international law, must be protected and allowed to stay. On the quay, they are met by a variety of aid organizations providing medical care. It's unusual to see Doctors Without Borders offering help in Europe. I think that it's most difficult was the moment when the boats arrive because when the people get out of the boat, they have survived the life-threatening uh, travel and they, they smile as they had done it, as they had arrived to some, to the end of their suffering. And we know that their suffering will go on once they are in Europe. So, yeah, I think that is extremely difficult because of, uh, of this terrible paradox, facing humanitarian crisis and deep human suffering in a rich country. Italian authorities say that over 31,000 migrants landed in Lampedusa in one year alone. No one knows how many boats have been lost at sea, and no one will ever know how many thousands have drowned. From the port, the migrants are transferred to a so-called reception center on the island. Walled in, exhausted, frustrated, Emotions can run high, and overcrowded conditions have sometimes led to rioting. Italy has little experience with people like these who keep coming to their shores in greater and greater numbers. When their number is called, it's time for one more journey. They have no idea they're on their way to yet another detention center. One of many scattered throughout Europe. The largest is Caltanissetta, tucked away in the hills of central Sicily. A prison atmosphere prevails, with armed soldiers guarding the enclosures. Here, migrants await their fate. Authorities will have to decide which ones have a legitimate asylum claim. Fulvio Vassalo Paleologo is professor of law at the University of Palermo. An advocate for the rights of migrants, he's come to assess the situation in Caltanissetta. È un fenomeno che è sfuggito al controllo. Per quanto possano aumentare le navi a mare, per quanto possano aumentare i lager per migranti come questo, tuttavia i migranti continuano ad arrivare e sono sempre più incontrollabili. In this holding area, most are awaiting deportation, and others, their appeals to be heard. Here, refugees experience firsthand the inconsistent asylum policies. And this is his whole story, what was problem he had in his, in his uh, country. Because this person, he says he's been refused. He's from the same place where the others were, but they got their papers. Why? From current, this moment is only a uh, worker migrant, but we cannot change the law now in this moment for you. I am here, I am here to demand the asylum of the government Italian. I have demanded the asylum, they have refused to give me the asylum. So they told me to make the recourse with the lawyer, and I made the recourse with the lawyer. They told me that I will stay in the camp for six months, and I will stay here in the camp. So I am still here. We don't help, we don't suffer, it doesn't go, it doesn't go. They don't give the papers to the noirs, they don't give the papers to the noirs. We are here, we don't suffer, it doesn't go. 
Nine, I have nine brothers, and I'm the senior. Tempers show the stress. To take care of them for their school and so on. And I spend a lot of money, pass all the desert to here. I've risked my life. Yeah, because as for me, I've been here for six years without the only record. I, 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 I'm a good man for my own son. You don't like us. You don't like us. You don't like us. You don't like us. I stop. Thank you. Come on, say. So we are here for them to help and to give us cares, okay? And they are not doing it. no paper for us, nothing, nothing. And we are spending here for a month, for a two months, three months, four months, staying in camp, doing nothing, having a dog brain, doing nothing. No, those things is not good for us. You understand? And we have a future. And this future is going down. L'Europa non è stata capace di adottare una direttiva per l'ingresso, per lavoro, per gli immigrati. Tutte le direttive approvate sono soltanto per chiudere o per respingere, ma non c'è una sola direttiva per far entrare legalmente delle persone. Most migrants who have made the perilous journey seeking work will be sent back. But lost in the shuffle will be the genuine refugees. The walls of the EU may be invisible to most Europeans, but the wall in the Middle East tears at the fabric of daily life. There are similarities between the barriers being constructed between the United States and Mexico, uh, Haiti and the Dominican Republic. What makes the wall in Jerusalem unique is that God is a local resident in this town. If you were able to access his zip code, it would, it would be here. Uh, Jerusalem shares with other conflicts and other walls the territorial dimension, the socioeconomic dimension, the immigration dimension, the visceral fears. In September 2000, a wave of suicide bombing hit Israel. Triggered by the collapse of the Camp David peace talks, the second Intifada unleashed a reign of terror on Israeli civilians. Over the next three years, more than a thousand Israelis were killed in buses, cafes, markets, anywhere people gathered. One August day in 2001, a suicide bomber entered Jerusalem's popular Sparrow Pizzeria. Yitzhak Maoz will never forget that day. C'est l'endroit où ma fille a été assassinée. Elle travaillait ici. Et le, le terroriste est rentré par, par la porte sur le côté et a explosé. Une famille qui attendait avec cinq, euh, cinq membres de la famille, toute la famille, cinq membres de la famille ont été assassinés sur, euh, sur le coup. Et ma fille était juste après. Voilà, Teila Maos, le nom de ma fille qui a été assassinée à cet endroit-là. There are plaques like this all over Israel commemorating victims of suicide bombers. In response to public pressure, Prime Minister Ariel Sharon approved the construction of a barrier to separate Israelis and Palestinians. Construction began in 2002. Part concrete wall, part electronic fence. At two million dollars a kilometer, it's Israel's biggest and costliest construction project. But a fence alone can't stop terrorism. Behind the fence, there is a huge intelligence network. Every inch of the fence is monitored in bunkers throughout the country. Screens are watched 24-7. The fence is armed with heat and motion sensors. A weapon launched near the fence? The information is relayed to patrol personnel on the ground. It takes three minutes for any suspicious action to be investigated. The barrier was born because of the security, because of the terror attack, because of the, uh, of the suicide bombers. But the root of the fence has a different purpose, to shape the final borders of Israel. Colonel Shaul Arielli is a member of the Council for Peace and Security and co-author of The Folly of the Wall. Sharon believes in the facts on the ground. So he tried to put a fence in those areas that 
he really believed that we can annex them to Israel. Following the 1967 Six-Day War, Israel gained control of the West Bank. In order to establish an Israeli presence there, the then Minister of Housing, Ariel Sharon, encouraged Israeli settlements in the occupied territories. In many of the areas, the route of the fence deviates from the Green Line, Israel's established border, cutting into the occupied territories to embrace the settlements. The task of deciding where the fence would go was given to the army. Colonel Danny Tirza was in charge. We tried to find out the right route of the fence that will stop the terrorism to come from the West Bank inside Israel and try to minimize the damage to the people that lives on the ground. In Bethlehem, Claire Anastas knows what it's like living with the wall. In order to see our relatives, my uncle, we used to just cross the street. This road it used to be the main street from ancient time. So it used to be the only entrance in between the holy city, Jerusalem and Bethlehem. So it was the most lively area in all Bethlehem. The wall has forced all businesses in the area to shut down, including Claire's gift shop and her husband's repair garage. They digged for two months here and they put the blocks in one day. They surrounded our building and our children, they went to school and returned back. They stood in, in front of their bedrooms and find themselves buried alive forever. For Israelis, the wall means they can sleep in peace. For Palestinians, it is a wall of despair. The graffiti speaks for itself. In addition to the fence, to protect the settlements, Israel has set up a matrix of roadblocks, watchtowers, concrete slabs, and checkpoints. Like this one at Hawara. The checkpoint sits on road number 60, the north-south route that runs through the West Bank, connecting the Palestinian cities of Nablus and Ramallah. The reason it's here is that it runs very close to some Israeli towns and settlements. 5,000 people pass through this checkpoint every day. Palestinians going from one part of the West Bank to another for shopping, school and other daily requirements. Because of the wall, the checkpoint is the only place most Palestinians come face to face with an Israeli. Daily life here has become just absolutely impossible. We have over 600 checkpoints, of course, and uh, now we have the wall. So you are living not just in a great prison, but the prison is divided into separate cells. And it's separating Palestinian from Palestinian, children from their schools, uh, family from family members, and so on. Not just separating Palestine from Israel and the rest of the world. Jerusalem and Bethlehem are eight kilometers from each other. It was not uncommon for people to commute between the two for work. That is, until the wall was built. One of the motivations of the wall was to reduce the numbers of Palestinians in the city. In 1967, about 25, 26 percent of the population was Palestinian, uh, the rest uh, Israeli. Today it's 34 percent, and within our lifetime it will be 50 percent. So part of the motivations in some places was to gerrymander the wall so as to exclude Palestinian residents. One of the consequences of the wall is that it has ended up separating families. Maureen Bato has a Jerusalem ID, which allows her to live there with her children a permit which is subject to review every few years. Her husband, Charlie, lives in Bethlehem. He's the owner of the Bahamas restaurant right next to the wall. He has a West Bank ID, which doesn't allow him to enter Jerusalem. He used to sneak into the city illegally to see his wife and children, but in the past two years, the wall has really become impermeable. Charlie applied for a permit under family reunification many times, but was denied. 
مشكله انه انا زدوش اعطوه تسريح مش ليش اخلي مرتي تضلها في القدس ف بقول طب انا كيف بدي اعيش انا مرتي كيف بدي اجيب اولاد يعني مشكله فهي ما بتسالني بتقول لي طب انت اذا هي انت عايش في هي قاعده بالقدس وانت عايش بتطلع كيف جبت اولاد قلت له باي انترنت So Charlie continued living in Bethlehem and Maureen lived in Jerusalem. She would come to visit on weekends, sometimes extending the visit by a few days. But the law says that a Jerusalem resident must have their center of life in Jerusalem. If you live anywhere else, you lose your Jerusalem ID. Every now and then I have to expect an uh, inspector come to my home to see if I am living there. The inspector will open my closet to see if I have clothes and he will open my refrigerator to see if I am putting food and they will open my garbage to see if I'm there just because they are coming there or I am always there. And it was very, very difficult. <laughs> Financially, it became a strain for Charlie to maintain two homes. Yeah. Life became impossible, and Maureen has made the difficult decision to move to Bethlehem. She has forfeited the right to live in Jerusalem and all the freedoms that entails. In rural areas, the pressure is on for farmers to keep working their land no matter how difficult it is. For the Palestinians, in this area, it's very important to keep the land because they know if they leave the land, Israel will build a new settlement. So Israel try to put, tries to put a lot of pressure on the Palestinians in this area just to, you know, to push them out, but not with a real transfer, but, you know, the pressure makes the work to demand this area to be as a part of the final status agreement. This olive grove near the Palestinian town of Jayus is an unusual hive of activity today. Israeli volunteers have come to help Abu Azam harvest his olives. When the separation barrier went up, Abu Azam, like many other Jayus farmers, was shut out of his own olive grove. An appeal won him limited access to his land again. I got a decision from the Israeli Supreme Court to have a permit. It has worked for three months, 24 September until 24 December. After that, I don't know if they will renew it for me or not. The permit, however, is only for Abu Azam. And harvesting olives is not a one-person job. Much to the chagrin of the Israeli government, a group of activists began the olive harvest movement. Without their help, farmers like Abu Asam could face economic ruin. Well, I consider this wall that was built by Israel on Palestinian land as uh, a grand theft enterprise. It steals our land. It steals our resources, particularly the water. It steals our freedom of movement. It steals our horizon. But more than anything, it abducts also any chances of peace in the region. In some Palestinian villages, opposition to the barrier has erupted in violence. Cut off from part of their land, the towns of Bilin and Nihilin have become flashpoints for the protests. The only purpose for this annexation will is just a land grab, not meant for security as they pretend. In what has become a dangerous Friday ritual, a peaceful protest quickly escalates as villagers and Israeli activists confront the military. Demonstrators throw stones and Israeli soldiers respond with tear gas and rubber bullets. As you see, they are building these five settlements. They have already built on our land. And, yes, and you know, it's, it's our hope that such, such crimes must be stopped against our civilians. Thank you very much. Because the soldiers are coming here.
Ramallah, the largest city in the West Bank, lies 10 kilometers north of Jerusalem. A bustling city, it serves as the administrative capital of the Palestinian Authority. It's also home to one of the Muslim world's major medical centers. Dr. Mustafa Barghouti is a physician whose activism has won him many supporters and pushed him into the political arena. Today, he is director of the Health Development Information and Policy Institute. Well, life before the wall was difficult, but it became impossible after building the wall. He lives in an area called Betexa, which means it's, it's part of the villages that are isolated by the wall from the surrounding areas. So they have only one clinic there, but it closes at one o'clock. Imagine what happens to a person who's developing a heart attack inside that community. There is no way for him or her to get out. Imagine a woman in labor, and usually women give birth at night, you know, when the gates are closed. 78 Palestinian women were blocked from crossing the checkpoints and had to give birth in front of the gates of the checkpoint. And one third of them have lost their babies. This aims, this policy aims at forcing people to become fed up and then leave. But we're not leaving. It's acknowledged by all parties involved that no final status agreement can be reached without deciding the fate of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the archetypal walled city with its nine gates. Each gate reflects the different ethnic groups that have lived in the city from time immemorial. This city, holy to the three great religions of the world, now has an unholy wall that divides it in new ways. We are on the main entrance to Jerusalem from the east. When Jesus ascended uh, from the Judean desert, having come down from the Galilee, this is how we enter Jerusalem. And this, this side of the wall is a Palestinian neighborhood, Ras al Amud, with tens of thousands of residents. On the other side of the wall, another Palestinian neighborhood, Abu Dis. The geographical names are different, but this is one community, one urban area. And the separation barrier here separates Palestinians from Palestinians. Uh, there are no Israelis here, no Israelis come here. Danny Zeideman is lawyer and counsel for the Jerusalem-based NGO Ir Amim, City of Nations, which tries to promote a sustainable future for Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, Israelis and Palestinians in Jerusalem are like Siamese twins, uh, sharing more and less vital organs. There's no good place to put a wall because we are so intertwined. We, uh, I have a beagle, and when we took him to the vet, the beagle, the vet suggested that we put a GPS chip in his ear so that when he runs off looking for rabbits, we'll be able to find him. Now, if by some Orwellian twist you were to put a GPS chip in the ear of every Israeli and every Palestinian in Jerusalem, you'd see the border. Where Israelis walk today will be Israel. Where Palestinians walk today will be Palestine. And that solves 95% of the border regime in Jerusalem. And where both walk, which is the old city and its immediate environs, there'll be special arrangements or a special regime. The American poet Robert Frost put it this way, something there is that doesn't love a wall. But love them or hate them, the question remains, do walls work? Sometimes you need for short periods of time fences to make correct neighbors. They don't make good neighbors. When you build a fence and a wall, then actually the other side becomes invisible. What becomes invisible becomes an even bigger threat than the threat you can see. So rather than solve problems, a wall may exacerbate them. Qassam rockets fired over the wall into Israel remind us that a determined enemy will always find a way. Will America be safer when the wall is completed? It has certainly slowed the annual flow of migrant workers. But the drug wars and attendant bloodshed are spilling across the border, the wall notwithstanding. The border is not an effective tool for fighting crime. 
We have rules to fight crime. We have an intelligence community that does this all the time. We have infiltrators. We have, we know how to do this. That's why I think that the border is not the right place to invest so much money for fighting crime. It's not for that. Increasingly in the West, especially when times are tough, migration is being seen as a threat. But the life of a migrant, even when allowed to stay in Europe, can be a bitter disappointment. Hard to believe, but this shantytown is in Rome. The decision to come to Europe is very often based on disinformation or misinformation. People honestly think that they will find in Europe an El Dorado which is not there. Whether we like it or not, whether we want it or not, is not a matter of fact. I mean, we simply cannot cope with their level of expectation. But is walling them out the answer? The European Union has prospered in large measure through the free movement of people pursuing opportunities. There may be lessons here for North America. The movement of persons is a huge element of development between countries. That's why the development of North America will only be increased if we set a goal of freedom of movement of persons throughout North America with Mexico and Canada. Whether in North America, Europe, or the Middle East, building walls is expensive and perhaps more costly in terms of lives and human rights. You have to address issues that there are issues of development, that there are issues of injustice, that in, in the world of globalization, in many ways you are your brother's keeper or your sister's keeper. You have to be able to help rather than once you, you see those causes, you put up a wall to prevent it, a spillover effect. Because people can find ways around walls. And walls anyway end up being destroyed and eroded by the human will and human spirit.